Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then... You ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of American Civil War with your hosts, Bang and Dang. And we are moving on to the um, Union trying to threaten Charleston coming up here with the uh, Battle of Secession Bill, also known as the First Battle of James Island. And the Battle of St. Charles. And we got the Battle of Simmons Bluff. Decent little stuff taking place here. Three battles. Pretty decent um, size of them, I guess. We'll but see. Actually, we battles, I hope. We'll and um, what is it? June? Yeah. July. Oh, oh, yeah. We got about a month until Second Bow Run. So Ooh. some action coming along here. The importance of Charleston to the Confederate cause after the Union implemented their Anaconda plan can be summarized in the words. Of the old general himself, Robert E. Lee, he says the loss of Charleston would cut us off almost entirely from communications with the rest of the world and close the only channel through which we can expect to get supplies from abroad. Now, almost our only dependence, right? Because they cut off the Mississippi. They can't do anything. So, wow. And they still hold on for two and a half years. After I don't that. get it. Uh, after the Battle of Port Royal, which we covered, the Union planned an expedition against Charleston, capturing Edisto and John's Island. And by June 2nd, they had 20 vessels in the Stano Inlet. Union troops in a disto, Union troops on a disto moved to Seabrook's Island, then across John's Island to Laguerreville, and on to James Island at the Thomas Grimbo Plantation. Ooh, they're coming for ya. Ooh. The defenders of Charleston had laid breastworks across the 125-yard Y Peninsula, separating Filey Island from Morris Island. This secessionville work was referred to as the Tower Barry because of the reconnaissance platform. Thomas G. Lamar. Or Lammer. Or Lamar. Lamar <laughs> was in command of the battery while Brigadier General States Rights Gist. That's a hell of a name. Yeah, I think we didn't we uh, have him already? Um, so. It was like, yeah, his dad was like in the army or something. Right. Named him weird. Jeez. Anyway, he was in overall command of James Island. The battery included a Columbia Ed, two 24 pound rifled artillery pieces, Ooh, rifled, uh, several 18 pound guns, all manned by 500 men. Jeez. Secessionville itself consisted of a of a few Sumner home, Sumner of a few summer homes belonging to James Island planners. Okay, okay. Well, so. James Island defenses consisted of Fort Pemberton on the west coast, along the Stano River, south of Wapoo Creek, extending southwards to the Tower Battery and back up to Fort Johnson to the east along the Charleston Harbor. Okay, Confederate troops manned the defenses included the 24th South Carolina Infantry Regiment under the command of Colonel Clement H. Stevens, the Charleston Battalion, which was the first South Carolina battalion. So under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Pinor, Pinor, <laughs> Pinor, Pinor, <laughs> Pinor <laughs> Peter Charles Gaylord, Thomas Lamar's 1st Battalion of South Carolina Artillery, the Utah Battalion under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Simonton, the Palmetto Battalion under the command of Major E.B. White, 2nd okay. Battalion of South Carolina Artillery under the command of Major J.W. Brown, Colonel D. of the 3rd. <laughs> Company D, Company, uh, D. Company Colonel D, Company D of the 3rd Battalion, South Carolina Cavalry, and the Macbeth Light Artillery. Oh, geez. They were joined by the 4th Louisiana Battalion under the command of Lieutenant Colonel John McHenry, the PD Battalion, which was the 9th South Carolina Battalion, under the command of Lert Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander D. Smith, the 47th Georgia Volunteer Infantry, and the 22nd Ca South Carolina. Holy Why? shit. Why? And that was all just 500 men in all those different... I think it was more than 500 men. Just those bad guns were manned oh. by 500. Jeez, oh, Pete, man. Hey, man. Gotta give credit where credit's due. I guess early June 1862, Union Major General David Hunter transported the Union divisions of Brigadier Generals Horatio G. Wright and Isaac I. Stevens under the immediate direction of Brigadier General Henry Benham. He said, you guys are going to James Island. Mm -hmm. They were entrenched at Grimbo's Landing near the southern flank of the Confederate defenses. Benham landed 6,600 6, men from the 3rd New Hampshire to 8th Michigan, 7th, Con Con 7th Connecticut, 28th Massachusetts, 100th Pennsylvania, 46th New York Volunteer Infantry, uh, the 3rd Rhode Island Heavy Artillery, and the 79th New York Highlanders. Everybody yeah. knows about the Highlanders. Uh, and they gathered all these on the southeastern end of James Island, and they marched towards Charleston. That's crazy. The Yankees' first name was the Highlanders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. June 10th. General John C. Pember Pemberton sent the 1st South Carolina Rifle Regiment and the 4th Louisiana Battalion under the command of Colonel Haggood, supported by the 47th Virginia, or uh, Georgia, under the command of Colonel Gilbert W. M. Williams to Grimble's Plantation. His intent was to establish a Confederate battery in opposition to the Union gunboats. However, oh, however, 
47th New York Volunteers and the 50 or 45th Pennsylvania Infantry plus the 97th Pennsylvania Infantry put up an effective defense and the Confederates were repulsed. They're repulsed. They said, get out of here. June 14th, Brigadier General Nathan Shanks Evans arrived with two regiments and took command of Confederate forces. For the next two days, the Federal and Confederate batteries exchanged fire. Okay. Captain Joshua Jamison's 100-man detachment from the 22nd South Carolina joined the battery on the morning of the 16th. All right. So we got got more, some backup. That's more ribs coming in. Mm -hmm. About 4.30 a.m., 16th of June, 1862, the Northern troops attacked the Confederate fort at Secessionville, where Colonel Thomas G. Lamar commanded about five hundos. We got 500 men over here. We had a number of very heavy artillery guns. Very heavy. And a good field of fire. It's hmm. good for that. Good for that. Marshy terrain to the north. And south would constrict any unit in advance. Yeah, it's hard to go through the, the old marshes. Right. And the lead was the 8th Michigan. Yeah, put the Michiganders out front. Behind them was the 7th Connecticut and the 28th Massachusetts. The 8th Michigan were mowed down in swaths. I'm sure they were. From a shower of musket balls and discharges of grape and canister. Wow. And that's all from the Confederate cannons, according to a Union officer. That's a quote he said. He goes, those poor Michigan boys. Damn. God rest her soul. Mm -hmm. Yet, some of the Union infantrymen made it into the uh, fort fighting oh. the Confederate artillerymen hand to hand before Confederate infantry reinforcements arrived to help Lamar's decimated men. Okay, well, getting in there hand to hand. Uh, these these were uh, the ones that came to help were Lieutenant Colonel Alexander D. Smith's 9th South Carolina Battalion up from Secession Bill. They came. Lieutenant Colonel Peter Gaylord's Charleston Battalion soon followed, and the battle became a rifle match nice. along the battery wall and swamp lines. Fantastic. Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Holley's 7th Connecticut uh, advance halted when their left flank became mirrored in the mush, yeah. the mush marsh mud, and their right received canister and grape shots. Oh, geez. 28th Massachusetts followed the 7th in the same mire, and both regiments became intermingled as the Confederates continued to shoot and shell the confused mass of men. Why would they even continue to try? In the meantime... Lieutenant Colonel John McHenry's 4th Louisiana advanced to reinforce Lamar's garrison while Simonton's Utah Battalion advanced along Battery Island Road to face the Union left flank. I mean, but taking hey, taking your... Uh, we're getting mowed down trying to go right. through this marshy shit, but let's just try it. Let's just keep doing it. Oh, my. <sighs> wow. And you, <clears throat> a Union battery, the 1st Connecticut, under Captain Alfred P. Rockwell, finally started firing on the Confederate garrison as the Highlanders of the 79th New York under Lieutenant Colonel David Morrison, advanced. Confederate artillery fire forced the 79th to the right flank of the fort, where they joined the remnants of the 8th <laughs> Michigan. <laughs> the remnants. All right. Mm. The 79th mounted the top of a tower battery and went over the wall. Oh, nice. In the end, however, they were repulsed, wow. as has the 8th Michigan before them. When reinforcements failed to appear, the of course. 100th Pennsylvania roundheads, under the command of Major David Leckie, tried to support the Highlanders. But their attack stalled, as did the previous ones with Confederate canister and grape mm. and the marshy lands. Right. Colonel Rudolph Rosa's 46 New York tried to line up on 100's left. Well, that is Connecticut. But some retreated with fleeing Irish 28th Massachusetts. and 100th uh, from Pennsylvania. Yeah. Or Connecticut, sorry. No, the 100th was Pennsylvania. Was it Pennsylvania? Yeah. The first was Connecticut. Right. right. And, uh... uh Okay, so they tried to line up with the 100s left, but some retreated with the fleeing Irish from the 28th Massachusetts, the 7th Connecticut as well, while the remainder received Confederate canister. Of course They're they like, did. Oh, hey, you guys want to stay? Here you go. <laughs> Here's some canister. <laughs> Finally, Colonel Daniel Leisure <laughs> ordered a general retreat. He said, not leisurely, though. Isaac Stevens ordered the 28th Massachusetts, the 100th Pennsylvania, 46th New York, 8th Michigan, 79th New York, and the 7th Connecticut to retreat back towards the hedges. Right. The attack had lasted less than 45 minutes. Oh, jeez. Yet, the Union advances were not over. Oh. On the other side of the marsh to the north was a piece of uh, land in 3rd New Hampshire under Lieutenant Colonel John H. Jackson, who was supported by Major Edwin Metcalf's 3rd Rhode Island, used to advance upon the right flank of the Tower Battery. However, 150 yards of marsh prevented any Union advance upon the fort's defenders while Confederate batteries to the north fired into their backs. Obviously. Guys, there's marshes all around these right. dudes. Right. Jeez. Well, by then, the 4th Louisiana had advanced to the fort's defense. Of course they have. Additionally, the Utah Battalion had advanced to the 24th South Carolina's east-west picket line of the Battery Island Road. In a heavy thicket north of the Union's 3rd Rhode Island and the 3rd New Hampshire, the 3rd New Hampshire were now encircled in a ring of fire. <sighs> forcing their retreat back to the west, while the third Rhode Island, who had advanced upon the Confederate thicket to the north, were all forced to retreat as well. Mm. 
Yes. Well, they're charging with bayonets now. Dude. Hand-to-hand combat. Mm. Well, Fixed t- bayonets. That's what right. they said. Thomas Amar was hailed as the hero of secession build after this. While Benham feared further casualties among his, among his uh, six shattered regiments after three assaults and declared the battle a reconnaissance in force. Right. Oh, Hunter relieved Benham of his command for disobedience, Uh-oh. citing the 10th of June directive forbidding an attack on Charleston or Fort Johnson oh. and placed under arrest. He wasn't even supposed to do this. Wow. On June 27th, Hunter ordered the abandonment of James Island, and by July 7th, off Union forces were gone. Right. They were like, we shouldn't have been here in the first place, and look what happened. Mm-hmm. Then poor Michigan guys. Right. January 26, 1863, Judge Advocate General of the United States Army General Joseph Holt decided Benham's attack was justified and was not prohibited by the 10th of June directive. However, right. Benham would never again be given a field command. Right. Yeah, after what he just did there? Yeah, why was his attack justified? He had no reason even going there. Yeah, so that was... Uh, uh, <laughs> that was Secessionville, fucking Routeville. That's what they call that. Yeah, that was a stupid decision by uh, the old Union there. Yeah, well, mm. it wasn't really by the Union, by one guy. Right, let's just get all these guys and go through this marshy ass shit. They can barely walk. Can't take no heavy artillery with us. No. All we guys are muskets and rifles. See what happens. Yep, just as I thought. <laughs> Let's go back. <laughs> oh, we have no choice but to go back. Right. Not, we're not doing this voluntarily. No. Battle of St. Charles. Mm-hmm. Next day. Fought on 17th of June, 1862 in St. Charles, Arkansas. After the election of Abraham Lincoln as president of the United States in 1860, Several southern states considered succeeding from the Union. Which they are, did. You know? <laughs> Obviously, we're here for a reason. <laughs> well, we all know that Arkansas um, held a statewide election on 18 February 1861 to create a convention to vote on succession. They did. Which uh, never happened. They decided to stay neutral, right? Well, they, hold the, they held the convention. Right. Slavery was considered, considered to be a key issue after convening on the 4th of March. Same day Lincoln was inaugurated, the convention adjourned on the 21st without reaching a conclusion. We all know what happened. Yep. Well, we already know the um, right. yeah. Yeah, everything about Arkansas. We have a significant military activity in Missouri through 1861. Major General Earl Van Dorn of the United States Confederate Army. <laughs> Major General Earl Van Dorn of the Confederate States Army formed the Army of the West. Yep. In early March of 1862, from forces commanded by Missouri State Guard Major General Sterling Price. Confederate Brigadier General Ben McCullough. McCulloch. Van Dorn moved his army north towards the Union Army of Major General Samuel R. Curtis, but was defeated at the Battle of Pea Ridge, yep. 7th, 8th, in March. Which we covered very, very early on in the war. Right. After that defeat, Van Dorn moved his troops east to the Mississippi River, with the movement completed by late April. During the process, Van Dorn essentially stripped Arkansas of its military strength and supplies and weakened the Confederate Trans-Mississippi Department. Mm-hmm. Well... Curtis fell back into Missouri after the battle, but then moved his army west or east to West Plains before turning south. They re-entered Arkansas on April 29th and headed for Batesville. Uh-oh. May 2nd, by May 2nd, the Union soldiers had reached Batesville, and a separate column commanded by Brigadier General Frederick Steele reached Jacksonport, which was near Batesville and on the White River. But that happened on May 4th. Right. Curtis absorbed Steele's men into his force and began to move on the state capital at Little Rock. Oh. The movement caused the Confederate government of Arkansas Arkansas, <laughs> Arkansas to retire to Hot Springs. Oh, going oh Hot there springs. was all, uh, Al Capone and everything. Yeah, you're going yeah, to go to Hot Springs. All right. And Curtis's men crossed the White River near Batesville. Uh, oh. Mm-hmm. May 19th, a small Union force crossed the Little Red River t- to forage, but was attacked by Confederate cavalry near Searcy. Okay. Some of the Union soldiers, including wounded men, were murdered while attempting to surrender. Oh, oh no. Curtis was informed the next day that his line of supply was at the breaking point, and he decided that further advance with that a new supply line was untenable. He's like, you can't do it. Got to have a supply line, guy. A small offensive across the Little Red on May 27th was successful, but lack of supplies forced Curtis to withdraw back across both the Little Red and the White Rivers. And he sent a message to the Union leadership in St. Louis on the 4th of June that he would need to continue his retreat if not reinforced. He's like, I can't stop. By the time you get this letter. I need more men, guys. By the time you get this letter, I'm going to be 100 miles from where I sent Mm, it. Right. Well, this message was forwarded to Major General Henry Halleck, who then directed Flag Officer Charles Davis to send flotilla to send a flotilla up the White River to Jacksonport to resupply Curtis as the roads in that region of Arkansas were too poor for easy resupply by land. Right. Halleck also communicated with uh, United States Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, who in turn passed the communication to Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells, who sent a telegram to Davis ordering him to move. That's a lot of uh, moving parts there. All right. 
A telegram to Davis ordering him to move up to uh, the white to relieve Curtis. Davis received Wells' telegram on June 12th and began making immediate preparations for the movement. He asked Colonel Charles R. Ellett, who was commander of the Ram Fleet, to send some of the Ram ships to serve with the vessel of Davis's Western Flotilla, but Ellett would agree to, to this only under the condition that the Ram Fleet and Western Flotilla vessels would be separate commands, which Davis refused. He said, oh, no, I want command of all of them. Right. See, these little um, egos and shit get in the way. Like, who gives a shit? All right. So you, they're, they're, they're totally two different things, so you command yours, he commands his. Right, and you're all being commanded by the top right. anyway. Exactly. Jeez, old Dumb. Less than a week before, on the 6th of June, the Ram fleet under Ellett's father, Charles Ellett Jr., and Davis's flotilla had defeated a Confederate naval fleet at the First Battle of Memphis. Hey, just a couple days ago. And taken the city of Memphis, Tennessee. Sure have. The furthest north Confederate stronghold on the Mississippi River was now Vicksburg. Yep. As positions upriver at Columbus, Kentucky, and Island Number 10 had been taken earlier in the year, yes, which sir. They did, few Confederate gunboats remained on the upper portion of the Mississippi, and they were generally in hiding. Oh, yeah. Jeez. Stupid. Sad. Once, once uh, New Orleans, it was over. Yeah. It was over. Man, couldn't do nothing about it by then. On June 13th, Davis's detached left Memphis. It was composed of the ironclad USS Mound City and USS St. Louis, the timberclad USS Lexington, and the tugboat USS Spitfire. Nice. Ships were under the command of Commander Augustus Kilty. Hmm. On June 14th, the steamboat Willie, just kidding, hmm. steamboat White Cloud arrived at the Memphis, and it was to transport the supplies that would go to Curtis. Okay. Davis had uh, also heard that the Confederates had blocked the White River with a submerged wooden raft, which would have to be removed. Hmm. Ooh, booby trap, too, probably, huh? Expecting the river banks to be occupied by Confederate soldiers, Colonel Graham Fitch and the 46th Indiana Infantry were sent were sent on the transport New National to provide infantry support, and Fitch's force was almost a thousand men. Oh, a thousand. Oh, sir. Fantastic. Confederate Major General Thomas C. Hindman had replaced Van Dorn as commander in Arkansas, working to build up the remnants left by Van Dorn's departure. Him and declared martial law, oh, authorized geez. guerrilla warfare, geez. and formed the base of an army. Hey. Fantastic. After Curtis's expedition bogged down, Hindman anticipated a Union naval movement up either the White River or the Arkansas River. He sent out a surveying expedition on the 3rd of June to investigate the possibility of the blocking the rivers. Like, can we block these rivers? Let's go invest. Slow them down at least a little bit, right? Right. When the love of the Arkansas River fell, the Confederates focused on the White River. A site near St. Charles was selected as a favorable location for the emplacement of a battery on the bluffs and an obstruction in the river. Yes, sir. That way they come to that uh right. they come to that obstruction, you just fucking start opening fire. Right. They have no way, boss. They have to come this way. Mm -hmm. Captain A. M. Williams and hundred soldiers were sent to construct the emplacements. Logs were floated down river and driven into the river bottom as an obstruction and batteries were constructed on the bluffs. Oh. Kind of just said that in two sentences. Uh, right. There we go. Two rifle 32 pounders were taken from the gunboat CSS Ponchar train, hmm. Ponchar train, and mounted in the main battery on June 8th, while two three inch parrot rifles were sent from Little Rock and placed in a smaller position 400 yards away. Fantastic. Ponchar train's guns, Ponchar train's guns were placed on a commanded position on a bluff 75 feet above a bend in the river. Oh, fantastic. While they had an excellent field of fire, they were also masked by trees and brush. Look at that shit. Ain't nobody expecting mm -hmm. this. Well, yeah, but you come, in, you come into a block in the river. I mean, you got to be thinking right. something's up, right? Mm -hmm. The CSS, the gunboat CSS Marapas, 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 Marapas. Probably Marepis. 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 The gunboat CSS Marepis arrived at St. Charles on 14th of June. Two days later, Hinman was informed of Kilty's movement. With the obstruction incomplete and no other troops available to reinforce the St. Charles position, 35 sailors and naval officers from Pontachar Train, <laughs> including Lieutenant John W. Dunnington, the vessel's commander, volunteered and were sent to help men in the defenses. <clears throat> volunteered and were sent down to help man the defenses. Yeah. I mean, they got to do something. Right. Jeez. They arrived there at about 1800 that day, which is six. Yeah. Six o'clock p.m. <laughs> On the night of June 16th in the morning of the 17th, Williams informed Hinman that the Union forces had reached the area and that the obstruction still was not complete. Him and ordered two civilian steamboats at St. Charles scuttled to the Black Door. Hey, man, steal these two poor fishermen's boats and right. <laughs> scuttle them. Whatever you do, mm -hmm. you can't let them pass. All right. The commander of the Marepas, or Maripaz, Mar 
Marepas, Marpas, Marepas, whatever <laughs> the boat Captain Joseph Fry has also had his ship, which have been, which would have been mismatched against Union ironclad scuttled. Although a twelve pounder howitzer, a rifle cannon made of brass, and a third artillery piece were removed first. Obviously, All right. <laughs> the lower battery of three inch rifles was strengthened with the brass piece from Marepas and thirty four Williams men of the 29th Arkansas Infantry. The other members of the Arkansas Regiment did not have weapons and were sent back to Little Rock. Okay, why are you guys here? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the Confederate sailors were largely armed with single-shot pistols. Oh, jeez. Oh, my. And which would be of dubious values in a land battle, obviously. Overall, the Confederates had seven cannons and 114 men at St. Charles. They had nothing. No, obviously. Oh, my. Stupid. What the hell's going on here? How is this war even still going on? I don't get it. <laughs> I don't know. Because as soon as the Union gets an upper hand, they do something fucking stupid, right. and then it just goes back and forth between who can out-stupid each other. Right. Jeez, OP. Before daybreak on June 17th, the Confederates made dispositions to defend against the attack. Dunningham and his men were in the upper battery, manning the two 32-pounders, while men from Arapas manned the lower position, which contained three guns. The infantry men were sent downstream under Williams to serve as sharpshooters and were supported by the 12-pound howitzer, taken off the Marapas. Fry was in all our overall command of this. Around 6 p.m., Kilty, 6 a.m., mm-hmm. Kilty ships began moving upriver again. Mound City led the approach, with St. Louis, Lexington, and Conestoga following in the rear. The other vessels were not armed and were in the rear as well. <laughs> <laughs> or in the rear of the rear. Right. Or in the rear, rear. <laughs> the rear, rear. Back, back. In the back, right, back. Right. And within two and a half miles of St. Charles, Confederates were sighted on the riverbank. Oh, so much for that brush and shit. Right. Uh, Mountain City opened fire and scattered them, after which the Indiana Infantry disembarked from Jacob Musselman and the New National. Okay. They're like, getting off. We're on land now, boys. Sources disagree as to when the firing began. Right. Historian Ed Bears with two S is, states that the firing started at 736 a.m., while mm-hmm. historian Mark Hubbs provides 9 a.m. Okay. It's a hell of a fucking discrepancy there. Dunnington himself stated that the fighting began around 8.30 30 Well, I guess I have to believe Dunnington. Uh, uh, I would say it's between uh, 7.30 and 9. How about that? <laughs> right. Conestoga and Lexington began uh, contributing fire later. One, okay. Once Fitch's men were ashore, two companies were thrown out as a skirmish line, and the men began advancing towards the Confederate defenses. It was planned for Fitch's men on shore and the ships in the river to move at about the same rate. Okay. I mean, obviously, right? Mount City kept steaming forward. Lower Confederate battery opened fire when the ship was almost upon it without effect. Because, of course. Right. Kilty was unsure of the exact locations of Confederate batteries and had two timberclads hold back while the ironclads moved forward. Well, how about this? When they're firing, you take note of where they're coming from. <laughs> like, uh, those, those wooden boats back there, you guys must well stay. Yeah, don't be doing that because that should have gone right through you. All right. For 15 minutes, the two ships dueled with the lower battery before Mount City moved ahead. And she neared point blank range of Dunnington's battery. The Confederates opened fire, but at first were unable to damage the Union vessel. Mm. Meanwhile, Fitch's men had advanced and were about to attack the lower Confederate position. When a solid shot, the third fire from Dunnington's position struck Mount City at 10.03 a.m. Oh, uh, mm, that shot hit the ironclad's casemate near a gun port and penetrated the armor, killing three, oh. three or four sailors outright. Dang. The shot then punctured one of the ship's poorly protected steam drums. <gasps> which connected the ship's engines and fed them oh. pressurized steam. Oh, no. Steam filled the ship. Oh, yeah, scalding many of the ship's men. Damn right. Damn. Many of those not near escape points were killed. Oh, no. Of the roughly 170 men on board Mound City, 105 or 125 were killed, and a further 25 or 44 were wounded. Okay, I guess we don't know. Only 25 or 26 <laughs> escaped on her. Oh, Can we get a definite number of all this right. shit? <laughs> this shot has been described as the deadliest shot of the war. One shot? Yeah, took out that many men? Fuck yeah, dude. Crazy. Wow. That would suck. That steam would be the worst. Yeah. Dang. Well, yeah. Right. And then not even that. The steam's pouring out. You can probably see it from right. all over the wit. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. done. They're done. With steam pouring out and badly scalded men visible on the decks, Mound City drifted downstream and ran into the riverbank near the lower battery. Fry demanded that the remaining Union soldiers aboard surrender. And when this was refused, ordered his men to fire upon these Union sailors in the river, trying to swim to safety. <laughs> what? That's dirty, dude. Several of the wounded men were killed when the Confederates opened fire. With Mound City out of the fight, St. Louis 
and Dunnington's guns began dueling with each other. They're like, <laughs> until Fitch signaled for the ships to cease fire. Ooh. The Union infantry men were able to storm the Confederate fortifications, and Fitch wanted to prevent accidental friendly fire. Hey, it's the first smart thing anybody's done today. All right. Scaling the bluffs, Fitch's men moved into position from uh, which to outflank the Confederate defenses. Did they, though? Williams attempted to have some of his men occupy occupy Charles Belknap's house as a defensive position, but the Union men beat them to the position. Oh. After learning of this, Fry had the guns and lower battery spiked and the position abandoned. Oh, He's like, shit. Right. Spiking the cannons, cannons. Spiking the cannons involved driving a metal spike into the touch hole of the cannon to temporarily prevent it from being capable of firing. Yeah, right. because you got to take time to get it out of there. Yeah. After a short skirmish, it became clear that the Confederates would be captured if they did not retreat. Right. Damn, so after all that, they killed all those men on that boat and right. they still got to retreat. He's so, mm. poorly organized, poorly Freaking lead. Yeah. Fry ordered Dunnington to cover the retreat with his men, but Dunnington refused, noting that some of his men weren't unarmed. Right. And those who are had only had single shot pistols. Yeah, he's on the bluff, not expecting nobody to reach him. So he's like, and those pistols are pistols already been empty. That Mount City survivors. And he goes, We have no time to reload. A yeah. final cannon shot was fired at St. Louis, and the Confederates then scattered with the Union troops within 50 yards. Wow. Ooh. During the retreat, Fry was wounded and captured while uh-huh. trying to reach the Belknap House. Bel- Nobody tried to Belknap. U- reach the Belknap House, right. Belknap House when there was already a union there. Right. In addition to Fry, 29 others were captured, although six of them were prisoners Fry had been holding on suspicion of treason. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, whatever. <laughs> After, <laughs> After taking the Confederate fortifications, Fitch signaled the ships. He said, come on, Lexington and St. Louis. You shall advance up to where the sunken Dude, ship blocks the river. These rivers, even Robert E. Lee are like, we, right. These rivers we need, and yet we're not putting anything there. We, we put a measly hundred men. Right. No. And single shot pistols. <laughs> what the? F- I mean, come on. Um, yeah. Lexington and St. Louis came up to where the sunken ships blocked the river while Conestoga and Spiteful towed Mount City downstream. Jeez. Uh, Union soldiers were sent into St. Charles to patrol the town and the local civilians were warned that it would be raised if guerrilla activity recor- occurred. Because remember, they he um, he approved guerrilla warfare. The dude did. So these oh. citizens can technically do whatever the fuck they want to right. these people. Right. Uh, as punishment for the firing on Mound City's wounded, 20 of the Confederate prisoners were placed under arrest. Damn right. Including Fry. The battle was over in under four hours. Okay. Jeez, OP. That's just where it's happening. There's right. nothing there. Nothing. It's crazy. Ridiculous. Kiltry was among those scalded on Mound City, and his wounds resulted in the loss of an arm. Jeez, dude. Just from steam. Jeez. Lieutenant Wilson McNugal. McGunnigal. 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 McGunnigly. 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 Lieutenant Wilson McGunnigly. <laughs> Thank I don't know. <laughs> commander of the St. Louis replaced him as an expedition commander. Like sweet. The highest ranking on her officer of Mount City had been unnerved by the events and was replaced by an officer from Conestoga. Wait. All right. All right. The 58 or 59 man replacement crew from Mount City was drawn from the 46th Indiana. Either 58 or 59 Union dead were buried in a mass grave at the lower battery. Wow. While eight Confederates were buried in St. Charles. Henman claimed losses of six dead and one wounded. The Civil War Battlefield Guide estimates that Union had about 160 casualties and the Confederates lost about 40. Mm-mm. Mm. <laughs> and st- sad, sad. No serious casualties were suffered by the 46th Indiana, though, while it captured the batteries. The historian Mark K. Christ. Mark K. Chris, I'm going to call you, provides Confederate losses as eight killed, 24 wounded. Historian Mark Hubb suggests that 7% of all Union Navy battle deaths in the entire war were the result of uh, the ones who died on Mound City. Mm, maybe. The wounded, well, I mean, Navy really didn't do right. that much. Right. Um, the Union wounded were sent back down to Memphis on the Conestoga. Six Confederate cannons had been captured on the field. Four were sent to Memphis, and two 32-pounders were spiked and dumped into the river. Yep. The Union troops destroyed the Confederate fortifications after the battle. Okay. Like, fuck you guys. He's OP. Well, Hidman had sent the 10th Texas to reinforce St. Charles, but the unit was delayed to be issued ammunition. Hmm. By this time, it was June 17th. After learning of the fall of the St. Charles, the Texans withdrew to Duval's Bluff, where they were reinforced by another regiment and a battalion and three artillery batteries, establishing a supply point at St. Charles. McGunnigley, 
McGonagall's Glaze fleet moved past the river obstructions and continued up the White River. The movement began on June 18th. Although Mound City was left behind, the damaged Ironclad later returned to service and survived the war. Good, oh, for, her. That. Good for her, dude. After meeting sporadic Confederate resistance on June 19th, the vessels reached Clarendon, Arkansas, where they halted due to low water. Oh. Fitch took out his men ashore and advanced five miles, but withdrew after losing 55 in a fight with the Confederate dismounted cavalry. Dang. After leaving Clarendon, McGonagall's flotilla continued north, where they halted for the night at a point in Monroe County known as Crooked Point Cutoff. Okay. Hmm. At Crooked Point Cutoff, McGonagall was informed by his pilots that falling river levels would likely strand the ships if they continued further north. So the decision was made to turn around. Oh, jeez. Fitch was opposed to falling back without resupplying Curtis, but the ships turned back on the morning of June 20th. Right, as you see, Curtis has not been resupplied yet. <laughs> right. By June 25th, they had returned to the mouth of the river. June 23rd, Major General Ulysses S. Grant had taken command of Union forces in Memphis. Mm. After receiving communication from Halleck that he still wanted Curtis reinforced, Grant sent additional supply vessels and transports loaded with the 34th and 43rd Indiana to join White River Flotilla on the 26th of June. Okay. Well, the new vessels reached the others on June 27th, and Lexington, Conestoga, and Spifo escorted the transports and supply ships upriver, leaving on June 28th under the command of Lieutenant James Shirk. Noon on June 30th, Shirk's vessels reached Clarendon. With water levels failing or falling, Shirk would not venture beyond the town. Right. Fitch wanted to continue but learned of a new Confederate strong point at Duvall's Bluff and decided that the infantry could not take the position without the gunboats. All right. The Union ships turned back down the river on July 3rd but began heading back upriver again on July 5th. What the hell? They wanted to really celebrate the 4th of July. Right. <laughs> Union forces reoccupied Clarendon on July 7th. No. Make up your damn mind. Right. What the hell is going on here? Curtis learned that the vessels would not be able to reach his position, so he severed his line of supply and had his men march down the right march down the White River for two weeks. This was the first time in a war that a Union army had campaigned without a direct line of supply. Jeez, that would suck. This would not occur again until the Vicksburg campaign the next year. Mm. Ooh. The emancipated slaves during this movement and foraging and plundering by his soldiers economically devastated the line of the march. Yeah, right. Hey, anybody in their way, they're taking anything they can from every, any yeah, town and okay. village they come, and they yeah, left them with nothing. That's dude. ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, hey, all's fair and love, love and war, they say, right? It's like a locust plague coming from <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Instead of insects, <laughs> you got fucking blue coats. Man. In one county alone, 1,500,000, wow. so 1.5 million of property damage was inflicted. Stupid. Jeez. The Confederates made only one serious attempt to halt Curtis's movement on the 7th of July. Brigadier General Albert Rust led Confederate cavalry in an assault on the Union force while it was crossing the Catch River. Cash. Uh, in the ensuing Battle of Cotton Plant, which I'm assuming we'll have coming up, Rust's attack was repulsed, and his men were then routed by a Union counterattack. Jeez, this this um, Curtis guy, huh? Right. McGunnelly's uh, vessels had stayed at Clarendon until July 8th, and Curtis's men did not reach there until July 9th. So he went to them. He said, you guys don't want to come to us? We'll come to you. Right. Having missed the supply rendezvous, Oh, oh! he didn't even come to them because they left on July 8th. He didn't get there to the 9th. <laughs> Having missed his supply rendezvous, Curtis had his troops leave the White and march to the Mississippi River town of Helena, Helena, which was reached on July 12th. The relief column itself turned up at Helena on July 15th. Helena was later used as a significant operating hub for the Union Army in the Vicksburg campaign. The Confederates never retook the city. Okay. A portion of this battlefield is listed on the... Uh, Register of historic places as the St. Charles battle site. Okay. Divers recovered two cannons from the river bottom in the 1930s and the Belknap house burned in 1962. Uh -oh. okay. Also on the historic registry is the St. Charles battle monument, a commemorative, commemorative marker placed in 1919. Unusually for a monument in the South, it commemorates both sides of the battle. It should. It should. Hmm. Right. Jeez. Not for them. Right. Okay. So moving on to the battle of Simmons bluff. That last battle, by the way, it was so stupidity as well. Yeah. What the hell is going on here, man? Jeez. I don't know. This Curtis guy sounds like a badass. Can we hear more? Well, he does. Huh? All right. The Battle of Simmons Bluff, minor bloodless Union victory, fought June 21st, 1862. Union forces had laid siege to Charleston, which was being resupplied from a nearby railroad. Union forces were eager to capture the city, so they sent the 55th Pennsylvania to server the railroad. Or sever it. <laughs> yep, the Severed Railroad to serve her. <laughs> the 55th Pennsylvania departed by sea shortly before the battle. 
in search of a place to land closer to the railroad. Hmm. 21st of June, 55th Pennsylvania came ashore at Guatemala Sound. Union forces discovered an encampment of the 16th South Carolina, quickly raised an encampment and engaged the Confederate forces. Nice, just came in and started fighting, man. We ain't come, we ain't come here to back down. We just got off. We just got out of the sea, man. Right. The Confederates scattered after the encampment was raised and were unable to launch an effective counterattack. There were no reports of injuries on either side. After the raid, the Union forces returned to their ships and abandoned their original de- objective, which was to interrupt the rail line to Charleston. Okay. Just because they ran into a few Confederates. So, guys, might as well uh, do one more. Got an episode worthy of more than 30 minutes here. Uh, we might as well move on to the Battle of Oak Grove in um, Virginia. The, our next like five battles are in Virginia, by the way. And this Virginia. one's taking place in Henrico County, Virginia, June 25th. 1862. Ooh, we got the big boys we going got at it. Huh? Robert E. Lee and McClellan oh, in here oh, oh, with the Army of the that. Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia, respectively. Uh, uh, it's the first of the Seven Days Battles, which we talked about last week, that um, Jackson freed up his troops for. So he's going to be meeting uh, Lee here. So, uh, yes, sir. Pretty equal their battle there. Uh, suffered a wounded part. Right. We're going to see Major General. George B. McClellan advances lines with the objective of bringing Richmond within range of a siege gun. So, can he do it? We can shall see. Uh-huh. Following the stalemate at the Battle of Seven Pines, which we covered a couple weeks ago on May 31st Did. and June 1st, 1862, McClellan's Army of the Potomac set passively in their positions around the eastern outskirts of Richmond. The new commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, General Robert E. Lee, used the following three and a half weeks to reorganize his army, extend his defensive lines, and plan offensive operations against McClellan. Okay. We had a large army. Right. McClellan received intelligence that Lee was prepared to move and that the arrival of Major General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson's force from the Shenandoah was imminent. Mm. Yeah. He was like, uh, Jackson just ran rough shit on our men all over right. um, the Shenandoah Valley, and he's coming up here, dude. Mm. We need to do something before that crazy son of a bitch arrives. You ain't kidding. Get him and Lee together? Oh, yeah. shit. McClellan decided to resume the offensive before Lee could. Mm-hmm. Anticipating Jackson's reinforcements marching from the north, he increased cavalry patrols on likely avenues of the approach. He wanted his advance. He wanted to advance his siege artillery about a mile and a half closer to the city by taking the high ground on a nine mile road. It was around Old Tavern. In preparation for that, he planned an attack on Oak Grove, south of Old Tavern and the Richmond and York River Railroad, which would position his men to attack Old Tavern from two directions. Okay. Known locally for a stand of tall oak trees. Oak Grove was the site of Major General D.H. Hill's assault at Seven Pines on the 31st of May and had seen numerous clashes between pickets since that time. Okay. Hmm. Did we do uh, that? Yeah. Can um can uh Seven Pines relax, dude? They can't even nobody in that right. area. You know? Well, the attack was planned to advance to the west along the axis of the Williamsburg Road in the direction of Richmond. Between the two armies was a small dense forest about twelve hundred miles twelve hundred yards wide bisected by the headwaters of White Oak Swamp. Two divisions of the Third Corps were selected for the assault, commanded by Brigadier Generals Joseph Hooker and Philip Kearney. Okay. Facing them was a division of the Confederate Major General Benjamin Huger. Fantastic. Jeez, oh, Pete. 8.30 a.m., 25th of June. Three Union brigades stepped off in order to line of battle. From right to left, they were commanded by Brigadier General Daniel E. Sickles, uh, Brigadier General Cuvier Grover, both of Hooker's division and Brigadier General John C. Robinson from Kearney's division. Although Robinson and Grover made good progress on the left and in the center, Sickles' New Yorkers encountered difficulties moving through their abatis. Then through the upper portions of the swamp and finally, yeah, they moved to the upper portions of the swamp and then finally met stiff Confederate resistance, all of which threw the federal line out of alignment. Like that. Huger took advantage of the confusion by launching a counterattack with the brigade of uh, Brigadier General Ambrose R. Wright against Grover's brigade. Okay. Well, adding to the confusion, one of Wright's Georgia rem- regiments wore red Zouave uniforms. Can't do that. Many of Grover's men believed that only the Union Army had Zouave units. Really? So were reluctant to fire on their own men. Okay. Wow. And they finally realized that Union troops would not be approaching from the direction of Richmond. Right. Why would Union troops be coming from Richmond? Right. They opened fire. (sighs) At a crucial moment in the battle, the 26th North Carolina of Brigadier General Robert Ransom's brigade, in their first combat engagement ever, delivered a perfectly synchronized volley of rifle fire against Sickles' brigade, breaking up its delayed attack and sending the 31st New York in a panic retreat, which Sickles described as disgraceful confusion. Right. 
Wow. I mean, they are from New York. Right. Inform them, sick, <laughs> inform them sickles reverse. Corps Commander Heitzelman ordered reinforcements sent forward and also notified Army Commander McClellan, who was attempting to manage the battle by telegraph from three miles away. Oh, come on. Get your ass right. over there. McClellan, unaware of most details of the engagement, became alarmed and at 1030 a.m. ordered his men to withdraw back to their entrenchments. An order that mystified his uh, subordinates on the scene. They're like, what? Why? Why? He telegraphed that he would be arriving in the front line in person. Which caused a two and a half hour uh, lull in the action. He says, "Guys, don't do shit more until I get there." Be there. Shit's happening, be. man. He's got to put his boots on. Right. It takes an hour just to put everything on. One p.m. Seeing that the situation was not as bad as he had feared, McClellan ordered his men forward to retake the ground for which they had already fought once that day. The fighting lasted until nightfall. Hmm. He was like, "What is? I came all the way down for t- <laughs> get the hell out, go <laughs> uh, fight." Uh, the minor battle was McClellan's only tactical offensive action against Richmond. Really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because Grant's the one that actually goes to Richmond. Yeah. His attack gained only 600 yards at a cost of over 1,000 casualties on both sides. Right. It was not strong enough to derail the offensive plan by Robert E. Lee, which had already been set in motion. Right. The next day, Lee seized the initiative by attacking at Beaver Dam Creek north of the Chickahominy River near Mechanicsville, the first major battle of the seven days and the beginning of a strategic retreat by the Union Army, right. of which will serve as a, uh, a um, cliffhanger. Because our next several battles, obviously, are going to be the seven days battles right. coming up. Right. And uh, should see some good little action there, at least. I'm hoping. Well, you had 68 killed here and 66 killed for the Union. Mm-hmm. I mean, for the Confederate. Yep. Because uh, June 26th, the next day after Oak Grove, we got the Battle of Beaver Dam Creek. And then the next day after that, the Battle of Gaines Mill. And then the day of and the day after that, we got the Battle of Garnets and Goldings Farm. Then we got the Battle of Savages Station on the 29th, 30th through July 1st. We got the Battle of Tampa and Florida. Then we go back to Virginia on the 30th, both days. Wow. So in, in Virginia on the same day, we got the Battle of Glenville and the Battle of White Oak Swamp. And then the following day, we have... Battle of Malvern Hill. That's, Holy shit. That's going to stop fighting in Virginia for a while. Yeah. Or at least for a week or two. Uh, a until month. They don't do it. They don't have another battle in Virginia until August 9th after that. They were like, dude, come on. Settle down. Right. Settle down. Then we go to Texas. We got Gaines Mills and A. Okay. And then we wrap it back up. August 22nd, Battle of Rappahannock Station. Battle of Manassas Station. And then the second Battle of Bow Run or second Manassas. All right in a row. Yeah, that's a bloody week there. Yep. Then we got the Battle of Richmond. Kentucky, that is. Right. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, got some good stuff coming up, though. So just hold with us, guys, so we get rid of these. Uh, not get rid of, but get through these small little skirmishes, all of them. All these small little skirmishes are are all tactically important or trying to be and leading up to the big ones. And, right leading up to the big offensive and trying to do something in the war. So that's what we have coming up. These were the battles of Secessionville, St. Charles, Simon's Bluff, or Simmons Bluff, and Oak Grove. Oak See Grove. you next week for the continuation of the seven days battles. And uh, that'll do it for us. In the meantime, go check out battles. Nope, you're already checking out battles of the American Civil War. Go check out Outlaws and Gunslingers, where this week's episode is going to be all about the um, Glenville shooting slash riots, where... Some stuff went down there. It was a little questionable. Um, got white cops hating against the black mayor and all sorts of craziness. Yeah. Well, shootout. Weird stuff there, but Yeah, good stuff. Um, Glenville riot shootout in Cleveland. And then also go check out This Week in Sports History, where we'll cover everything significant and not so significant in the world of sports history of the week. And uh, Bang Dang Networks, where you can find all that. Well... Whatever, just go check out the shows. Bang Dang Network and Outlaws and Gunslingers. We'll be back next week for the Battles of American Civil War with the Monster Michigan is with Bang Dang.